Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Playbook series. My name is Sharon Kachuku. Thank you all for making our time to be in this series this quarter, which is tagged Investment Strategy for Navigating the New Order. We are seeing, you know, a lot of trends and happenings in the market, both domestically and globally. And our aim today is to properly position our investors and our clients to be able to take actions and take advantage of the current market happenings. The title doesn't necessarily suggest that higher yields are the new order, but this presentation will be shedding more light as to it. On the call with me here are my colleagues who are seasoned professionals and they'll be taking us through the current happenings and investment choices together with our strategies for navigating these portfolios. I have Raymond Opara, who will be taking us through the global macroeconomy. I have Timmy Tokwa Omosui, who will be taking us through the domestic macroeconomy. I also have Babajide Atolagbe, who will be taking us through the global markets, and Victoria Njimanze, who will be taking us through the domestic markets. Not forgetting our chief investment officer, who is Robert Omotunde, who will be taking us through the team and the strategy for the new order. Um, I'll be handing over the floor to Raymond. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sharon, for the introduction. I'll be taking us through the global macroeconomic happenings for H1 2024 and our outlook into the rest of the year. So for inflation, we've seen that the global economy has remained, you know, remarkably resilient, you know, with good holding steady and inflation converging towards target levels. We understand that the journey has, you know, witnessed and marked significant events, you know, beginning with supply chain disruptions in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, you know, followed by a Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, you know, that triggered both global and, uh, that triggered both a global and energy food crisis, you know, and that led to a substantial rise in inflation. And all in all, you know, all this followed by a globally synchronized monetary policy tightening. And while we understand that, you know, these inflation trends are encouraging, it's important to note that we are not there yet. You know, and somewhat worryingly, the most recent headline and core inflation numbers, you know, are pushing upwards. And, you know, while we understand that these are temporary, you know, um, ups and downs, you know, there's a reason or, um, but there are, you know, large, large number of reasons to remain conservative with our forecast. You know, and in detail, what we saw from the inflation numbers is that most of this progress on inflation, you know, has, you know, been made from largely a decline in energy and food prices, you know, below historical levels. But on the contrary, we've seen that services inflation remains high, you know, and stubbornly so, and this could, you know, derail the disinflation part um, for 2024. So, and on monetary policy and goods, um, we've seen that um, monetary policy, we understand that the main or the priority for any monetary authority is to ease price pressures, right? But monetary authorities cannot lose sight of global goods, right? We've seen generally um, the global view on 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 goods, and that has showcased you know a divergence amongst countries. And all in all, you know we've seen how you know tighter monetary authority, tighter monetary conditions have affected you know um, global economies and how they fed. But typically, we understand that higher yields will typically translate to higher cost of corporate borrowings, you know, higher um, cost of housing loans, and generally reduced market activity. But this is not always the case. Um, across the United States, for example, we've seen that the labor market has remained um, um, resilient and also seen also sustained demand, you know, and this has largely supported global goods. But on the flip side, if you look at the euro area, if you look at the UK, you're seeing that these economies have been faced with an excessive, you know, good slowdown and um, similar lackluster demand, right? And on the other side, you know, we look at China. China has recorded, you know, poor um, post-COVID recovery. And we've seen that, um, you know, we've seen majorly from a downturn in majorly from a downturn in its in its real estate sector. But all in all, we understand that the major role of central banks will be to ease price pressures, you know, while maintaining um, steady inflation. We understand that this is a Herculean tax, but so far it's safe to say that the global economy approaches a soft landing. And for growth, you know, according to the IMF, you know, global growth estimated at um, 3.2% for 2023 is projected to continue at the same pace for 2024 and 2025. 
you know, the pace of expansion, we, we, we understand that it is rather low, you know, by historical standards, you know, owing to a myriad of factors, including elevated borrowing costs, like I initially hinted, um, the longer term um, effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, weak productivity, and, you know, more recently, um, increasing geopolitical tensions that pose a worry for global trade and, you know, further global collaborations. But, you know, for the IMF also, we've seen that the latest forecasts, um, you know, for global growth five years from now sits at 3.1%, and this is the lowest levels in decades. And for us, the concern is majorly on developing countries. You know, for developing countries, the pace of progress, you know, towards improved living standards has remained worrying. And this just implies the global divergence between um, um, economies. You know, the relative weaker growth on the um, developing economy side typically reflects structural inefficiencies in allocating capital and um, labor. And this poses a huge risk to um, a huge downside risk to the global growth outlook. And for and for the outlook for the outlook for 2024, um, we have we have highlighted three major pointers: inflation, global growth, and monetary policy. You know, for inflation, we anticipate that there will be a there will be mixed outcome for the rest of 2024. And as we've seen that going forward, you know, um, more, we've seen developing countries on the back burner, while more advanced countries have started to experience you know lower inflation. But and this you know is going to be the case going forward. You know. The low-income countries, we believe that they will suffer, you know, more, you know, more, more factors from the supply side constraints, you know, and other, you know, geopolitical tensions that may arise. On global goods, we understand that global goods still remains to the downside. We expect global goods to slow, but at a steady pace, supported by a strengthening labor market. And as we've seen across the U.S. and um, some other major economies, we've seen that employment numbers, unemployment numbers, still remain low. And we've seen that um, growth rates in terms of earnings still remain positively high. And on monetary policy, you know, we we understand the Herculean tax that you know monetary authorities are faced with, uh, majorly in terms of um, the battle between easing inflation and also maintaining steady growth. You know, for them, the case is you can't ease prematurely, and the other and on the other side, you can't delay too long. But what we've seen that with inflation gradually gravitating towards our targeted level in most economies, we believe that um, central banks, major central banks, will take their foot off, you know, um, the hawkish stance they had, and we'll see, you know, a less um, hawkish, more rather dovish stance to champion us into H2 2024. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raymond, for that presentation. Um, Timmy Tokwe, in light of these global inflation and growth challenges, how do you think Nigeria has performed or fared? All right, thank you very much, Sharon, for having me. Um, uh, Nigeria economy in 2023, we, we saw a lot of surprises, particularly on policy fronts, monetary policy to be precise. But more interestingly, we saw that the um, oil sector exited um, a recession that lasted for more than two years. That was quite commendable because if that had not happened, right, we would be looking at a major slowdown in economic growth because non-oil sector really performed poorly, particularly agriculture sector um, and other key sectors of the economy. But for financial sector, on the back of good any numbers and um, you know telecommunication that supported economic growth so by and large the number we saw in 2023 2.74 percent on an annual basis was far cry of what the government expected to to do in 2023 by about 100 basis points and that was also way lower than what was uh, uh, what we did in 2022 so moving on to what really was responsible for the performance in the oil sector we saw that compared to uh, a very low level that we uh, that that we experienced in June around June July 2022 we saw that oil production towards the tail end of last year improved somewhat even though we are still not as we are not producing at the optimal level but what we saw at the tail end of last year was quite commendable and it's still slightly above the 1 million barrel per day with the increase in oil prices, all of those factors were supportive. I was saying that going forward, if we're able to enjoy this factor, in addition in addition to the performance of non-oil sector, Nigeria economy should 
stay well afloat. However, if you compare what we did last year with the budget assumption, though this looks very optimistic given the challenges in the oil sector from um, vandalism, um, uh, among other uh, lack of investment, among other problems, this looks overly optimistic. However, we, we are quite positive that um, oil prices will provide a bit of support. So moving on to how prices have trended, especially as captured by inflation. We've seen a major surge in prices across the country. You know, according to the MBS, you know, um, headline inflation printed at 33.2% in March. I know an average Nigerian would complain that the prices we are seeing at the market are more than doubled. Yes, the MBS also accounted for that using the commodity price watch. It has accounted for the fact that, you know, our prices have jumped by nearly 100% across the board. But we understand the challenges with this, with the, with, with the composite figure. However, the trend actually is very suggestive because this is the highest inflation level since 1990s. That is quite alarming. And uh, we are also looking at, in terms of projection, we're saying that inflation is likely to decelerate uh, before the end of the year. And we are looking at the midpoint of 25.6%. And um, some of the factors that will be responsible include the sustained appreciation of the Naira, similar to what we are seeing at the moment, if that is extended to the end of the year, it's going to be very good. And if we see uh, the, uh, support from the government that, have been, uh, in, that, that we have fed food supply, in addition to other areas that are posing a lot of challenges, insecurity that are posing a lot of challenges for inflation. So all of that should be supportive of our outlook. However, a major shock could actually take the narrative such that Nigeria is beginning to look at a 30% uh, inflation level. So moving on to what today, because we, we are aware that the Monetary Policy Authority is very concerned about the level of inflation. You know, like I said, highest in, in since 1990s. That is very alarming. So they've put in place a number of policies because they are looking at two major approach. Uh, they are looking at how to rein in a massive depreciation of the Naira. In addition to that, managing money supply. So they've put together a couple of policies, some of what, what, uh, which we have followed keenly from a higher interest rate to uh, some reforms uh, with the Bureau de Change. And um, we've seen uh, some directives, even for the banking sector, in terms of the net open position, all the way to, to the limits of transaction for IMTUs. All of these are to achieve four major objectives, or I'll say about three of them. One, uh, liquidity in the FS market. Two, to ensure that the Nigerian banking sectors, uh, uh, the, the banks are not susceptible to FS risk because the level of volatility we have seen in recent time could actually pose a major risk to the sector. And um, again, to also build confidence, they've tried as much as possible to build confidence in the sector, to also ensure that the economy uh, um, exchange rate is properly anchored in addition to how they want to ensure that they, they tend to determine the direction of inflation. So you said the focus of this um, policy. So, and moving on, we have, we've seen some of the outcome of this policy and one of which is the convergence between the official market and the parallel market rate late last year. And that's quite commendable. And uh, though we, are, we've seen, uh, we, we have seen that um, um, th there was a bit of you know, divergence towards, uh, towards the tail end of last year, even into uh, January, but because of some of the recent move by the uh, Monetary Policy Authority to assure the market that they are committed to you know, a market-friendly um, uh, system where willing buyers and willing sellers are able to determine the pricing, that has really supported um, uh, the FS market in addition to a bit of support that they have provided to ensure that the FS market is um, is afloat. We we are very optimistic that some of if some of this approach is sustained, you know, um, uh, Naira could continue to regain its, its ground, you know, for the rest of the year. And moving on to our general outlook about the FS market, why we fully understand that the the condition of the FS market in terms of the market clearing price, that is what we think is ideal, is largely dependent on inflows of um of, of foreign reserves. Right and the supply of the FS market, we think that uh, uh, exchange will vary between 948 naira to a dollar and the 130, uh, 1354. And all of these are likely uh, hinged on the fa factors that we have here. But a uh, key on uh, among this factor is the condition of, of our FS reserves. And then um, 
looking at what has happened to the fiscal condition, we have seen a major deterioration within the last two years. Debt stock has doubled, and debt service um, um, uh, debt service to GDP ratio also shows that there's a bit of problem because uh, even we have uh, Nigeria has exceeded the um, threshold that is imposed by the debt management office. And then um, if you look at what what IMF also has placed as a as, as a threshold. We are just inching close close to that. And the problem has been the fact that our debt has not been productive because it's quite obvious looking at the revenue, our debt service to revenue ratio, and also looking at a revenue to GDP ratio. If you look at Nigeria compared to other um, uh, countries, we are not as efficient. We now understand why government had to put in place policy to ensure that we are um, efficient in terms of tax um, collection. And if you consider our budget as well, I think that is a bit interesting because for the first time in a while, Nigeria budget performance in terms of revenue, we we outperform revenue slightly. And in terms of expenditure as well, we we, we underperform that this shows that there's a bit, there's a bit of pr uh, prudency in that regard. And if this is sustained going forward, we know that it's going to reduce government debt stock because what brings about higher debt is more deficit. So we believe that if this is sustained for 2024 and going forward, Nigeria fiscal condition should be in the right place. And lastly, on the overview of what we think about key, these four key variables, inflation, GDP, exchange rate, and fiscal policy, we think that inflation would moderate. That does not necessarily mean that prices would decline. It's just going to mean that you know the increases we are seeing may slow down some, somewhat. And for GDP, we know that FS um, um, stability is quite crucial to economic growth, but then higher interest rate could be a setback. And for exchange, they will think that it will continue to move within the band of 900 to 13. Nonetheless, whatever happens to reserve at every point in time will determine where exchange will close at every point in time. And on fiscal policy, we think that as government continues to um, continues to get um, um, cheap funds, one of which you had on Saturday that Nigeria will be getting some 2.5 billion at a very cheap rate. All of these would continue to contribute positively uh, to Nigeria fiscal policy and, um, uh, and and fiscal condition as we move on for the rest of the year and um, into uh, next year. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you very much, Timmy Tokwe. Um, please don't forget to send in your questions so we can answer them before the end of this webinar. Kindly use the Q and A box, and you can also reach us on um, our email address aml at afriinvest.com. I'm sure, like everyone, is curious as to know to know how this update from Timitope has affected the financial, the global financial market. Baba Jide, can you please help shed more light at, shed more light to this? All right, thank you, Sharon. Um, for the global market, right, uh, market experienced um, a lot of volatility, and that is because, um, you know, coming into the year, investors had the perception that um, the continuous moderation in inflation in um, developed market and emerging market will be sustained in 2024, and the fact that um, central banks will, um, you know, be, will be quick to, you know, to cut um, interest rates. But coming into the year, um, the first three you know, months of the year, um, the um, macroeconomic narrative was completely different. As we you know, can take a clue from Raymond's presentation, in the US, for example, we saw inflation print at 3.1% in January, 3.2% in February, and 3.5% in March, right? And that sent a very you know, scary signal to market participants, as well as um, you know, central banks that um, might be starting the inflation cycle again. And you know what that means for the market is that Fed has always continued to um, you know communicate that um, they have their eyes on you know the economic data and then the economic data will inform or you know would notify them when to start cutting interest rates. Um, bearing in mind that in 2023, you know most of the expectation is that in 2024 the Fed is likely to cut interest rate three times, right? But now that inflation has you know started accelerating again. Um, that picture has completely changed, and that is what is responsible for the upward trend in, you know, fixed income yield in the, develop, in the developed market. Um, for example, the US 3.9% for the 10 year in December, and now it's as high as 4.2%, which is, you know, near the all-time high. For the euro bond market, uh, the market has also, you know, taken some, you know, steam in Q1, and that has largely... Um, being on the back of you know market reforms 
and um, you know um, improvement in debt sustainability risk for some countries, and also some intervention from the likes of IMF. I can say categorically that the likes of Ghana and Egypt has enjoyed some sort of patronage from IMF. Meanwhile, the reforms from the Central Bank of Nigeria has also kind of improved sentiments, and uh, that has reflected clearly in Nigerian European prices. Moving to um, the global equities market, um, so the global equities market has also had a fair share of its, um, you know, roller coaster, um, quite unlike um, the equities market, I must say, because. Um, Q1 is usually a quarter whereby we see a lot of returns in the equities market, but in this year, in the developed market, the returns have been largely, you know, to the downside. Uh, they've been bullish, but they've been relatively, you know, not in. You know, they've been in the single digit, right? For for the S and P, for example, 3.6 percent, Nasdaq 3.36 percent, and um, you know some other developed markets within that range. So the story is that. Um, despite the fact that um, you know, economic output is strong, corporate earnings are good, inflation seems to be moderating, but the single fact that no one knows when and by what magnitude the, the Fed is going to reduce interest rate has continued to put a sort of um, you know, dent on market performance, and that has clearly, clearly dominated um, returns for Q1. And I must say that um, if we take out the um, AI you know, saga, in, H, in, in Q1, um, you know, we can categorically say that the U.S. equities market may have not returned, um, you know, uh, may have not posted a positive return um, in the first quarter. But we look towards the second quarter to see how you know, market will, you know, come out, how economic growth will pan out, and how, um, you know, corporate earnings would be. Maybe that would inform um, sort of um, comeback in um, equities markets in Q2. Um, <clears throat> Moving gradually to the um, commodities market, right? So we, we kind of um, segregated the commodities market into three major phases, the energy, the metal, and, and the agriculture, right? And the energy um, actually, you know, you know, posted the positive performance in Q1. Um, gasoline price and brand price all moving um, upward. That is due to the geopolitical tension in the Middle East. Good prices also rebounded, particularly due to interest from China. And um, you know, supply shortages and drought also caused um, cocoa prices to rise by 139%. So the narrative in that space has been you know, relatively interesting as well. Um, for currencies markets, um, you know, most of the reforms that emerging market um, countries have taken have actually supported their um, currency comeback. Take, for example, Nigeria, which is leading in our basket by 41.44%. Uh, meanwhile, some developed markets continue to lag uh, based on the fact that um, um, central banks are you know, getting closer to um, the policy normalization. Meanwhile, for cryptocurrency, um, we've seen for housing, for the real estate sector, I beg your pardon, we've seen um, housing prices remain relatively sticky. That is because of supply concerns, inventories, has, in, inventories have been really, really tight, and um, the high interest rate has really really uh, put a dent on consumers' pockets and um, purchases are not really going on as we've seen in the past. Last but not the least on the global market is the cryptocurrency market. Uh, the market has put you know, a lot of joy and smiles on, in, on the faces of a number of people. Uh, we've, we've seen Bitcoin hit the all-time high at $73,000 and that is largely connected to you know, the declining inflation, the expected Fed pivot, as well as the approval of the SEC Bitcoin ETF in April, right? And all of that has continued to, you know, put prices on the upward trend. And um, we've also seen altcoins take that direction as well. At this point, I say put the end to the global market and allow Victoria to come and take the domestic market. Thank you. Thank you so much, Babajidi. Um, moving to Victoria. Victoria, a lot has happened in you know, the domestic market space in the past year. Can you just help, you know, bring us on to some of those events? All right, thank you so much, Sharon. And just like Timita Kwee mentioned during the course of this presentation, a lot has happened within the first quarter of the year. So we're going to be starting out by looking at what happened in the bonds market and then we'll move to the other um, sub-markets. So during the full year for 2023, um, we sort of witnessed a contract in the yield curve 
in both halves of the year. So in the first half of the year, we observed um, a flattening yield curve that was largely underpinned by the uncertainty you know, that was surrounding the policy direction ahead of the presidential election, while the second half of the year, we noted a more steeper yield curve um, with more clarity after the election. Then, of course, we had the new CBN um, leadership that embarked on various monetary policy tightening measures to curb, you know, price pressure. So coming into the year, a lot of investors were short on bond instruments, betting on, you know, a faster rising bond rates amid all of the policy expectation that was going to set the tone for the elevated levels that we saw on the yield side. So the expectation of rate increases influenced the yield direction of the market, and we did see sell pressure forcing you know, prices to nose dive and yields to increase across the curve for the first quarter, which just you know, largely reflect market realities. Then noteworthy to mention would be um, the inversion that we did witness on the curve. And this line just speaks to the yield comparing 2023 year and with the end of the first quarter. And um, an inverted yield curve is basically when the shorter term bond pays higher effective yield than the longer term bond. And, you know, we do expect to see correction on the curve, right? So the idea is to keep in mind that the inversion is not going to last forever and it does provide an opportunity for investors. And we have, of course, seen more players focusing on the shorter end of the curve, especially um, in the first quarter. Now, looking at how the treasury bills uh, market performed, looking at the auction rates, we saw the market opening the year on a bullish note, and that was likely on the back of system liquidity, right? However, going into the rest of the the quarter, lower system liquidity coupled with the high stop rate that we saw, you know, at the OMO auction by the CBN brought about some sort of bearish sentiment. You know, we saw a lot of market participants selling of their position in a bid to prepare for the high yield environment, right? So the bearish momentum was also further followed by the auction calendar. Remember, we got around one trillion on offer, right? And this also coincided with the increase that we also expected in NPR. And you know, towards the end, we did see some sort of mixed sentiment towards the end of the quarter, um, but largely tilted towards that bearish fire, still largely on the back of system liquidity. But of course, a lot of cherry picking still happened on that part. Now, moving on to how. Um, the money market indicators also performed. We did see lending rates also adjusting to mirror what we have seen on anchor rates, which is the NPR. And that is um, majorly what we see here. Just also speaking likely to have been market reflective rates based on recent happening in the financial market. Now, interestingly, would be us speaking to the NGS market, right? So last year, we did see the NGS close on a very strong note. Um, an impressive 45.9 percent and even in q1 we did see it finish strong followed majorly by you know renewed investors confidence in you know the listed companies but um so far especially now the month of april we are beginning to see some sort of negative notes um which sort of resonates with the broader sentiments um you know among market participants right so the sentiment is largely influenced by you know actions from the market players trying to digest all of the corporate earnings that we have received so far, you know, the potential dilution of banking stocks due to the recent, you know, announcement of the recapitalization. And, you know, there are other factors like the low dividend payout also that we are seeing there. But this chat largely speaks to how the um, NGS return is performing compared to, you know, inflation. And we're beginning, we are seeing some sort of real return, no matter how small on it, compared to what we have on the treasury bill side, which effective yield around this time was around 26%. Now, um, just looking at sectoral performance, trying to highlight how different sectors have performed. Um, last quarter, we saw the industrial sector coming on top, closely followed by the consumer goods, uh, compared to what we saw as a 20, 2023 year and where we had the oil and gas, and of course, the banking sector leading the pack. And um, speaking about how we compare, you know, to other countries, right? There was a comparative analysis um, with other select countries, which um, sort of suggests that the Nigerian market is quite expensive compared to others, or appears to be, um, you know, overpriced compared to others. And seeing how, you know, the 
market, there's a linkage across economies and globalization of you know, financial markets. Nigeria is also in competition for capital with other financial markets. And um, they also have similar characteristics and we also need to attract investors you know, with the whole risk tolerance um, notable to most of the um, frontier markets. So that said, just looking at it on the broader term, at the financial outlook and what we think for the for developed markets, for the fixed income developed markets, and even for the domestic fixed income markets, inflation is still on the front burner. For the developed markets, the inflation is still a key driver and that will determine what we are going to be expecting. And also here, fixed income, our domestic fixed income markets, inflation is still something that borders us and is still worrisome. For the equities market, developed side, uh, we're expecting some sort of moderation, um, you know, as the economy still remains quite healthy. Why here domestically, you know, we expect some sort of moderation as we go into um, the rest of the year, given all of the um, outlook that we have outlined earlier. And looking at the domestic the commodities markets, um, We've seen elevated oil prices in recent times because of geopolitical tension. So we expect external factors to keep driving what we see on the commodity side. While for currency and real estate, um, we expect some sort of retreat from the currency side, majorly on the back of the anticipated interest rate cuts. So we'll keep watch on what happens on that side. Thank you, Sharon. Back to you. Thank you so much, Victoria. Right about now, we'll be calling on our Chief Investment Officer, Ms. Robert Omotunde, who will be taking us through the theme and the strategy for the new order and also enlightening us on how it's going to positively affect us as investors. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, um, Sharon. And to my colleagues, they've done the heavy weight lifting and my job is much easier. Um, if you look at the trajectory of inflation vis-a-vis -vis the expected inflation over the uh, course of, say, five years from, I mean, to this current period, you will notice that we have seen um, a lot of misses, you know, between uh, what the expected inflation is and the headline, and the actual headline inflation. And as we have you know, said in the course of this presentation, we are seeing inflation proving a bit stubborn, you know, in major developed markets and even, you know, uh, frontier markets uh, such as Nigeria. Uh, for instance, the US is targeting a 2% inflation. And as we speak, you know, I mean, towards the end of last year, we saw some sort of moderation in inflation. But as we speak, inflation is, you know, uh, raising its ugly head again. Uh, currently at around 3.5%. As much as these you know, monetary policy authorities are interested in bringing down interest rates, uh, I mean, and um, you know, allowing the economy to find its equilibrium again, uh, the pressure coming from inflation is making that a bit difficult. Um, I mean, coming into the year, we had expected by, that by this time, we should have gotten below a 3% inflation. But here we are now still talking about the 3.5% in the US. That is not to say that we have not seen improvements in other, you know, clients, other developed markets like uh, the European Central Bank and, uh, uh, and the, you know, Bank of England. Have, you know, we've seen data consistently suggesting that inflation is moderating in those regions. And as we speak, you know, countries like, um, I mean, uh, regions like the European Central Bank uh, is, is already trying to, you know, um, give direction to the market on as to when inflation will moderate now. But when you look at all of the comments coming, you know, we try to do um, a sort of a textual analysis of uh, comments coming from, you know, the different, um, you know, global systemic uh, monetary authorities. Uh, particularly the U.S. Fed, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of England. And you will see one word that is common is inflation, you know, across board, although in some times is more pronounced, uh, such as the U.S., in the U.S., uh, by the U.S. Fed, as against other, you know, regions like the European Central Bank, who has already given direction as to when interest rate will moderate. 
that is starting from uh, June, uh, that is based on the last March meeting held by the European Central Bank. Uh, for Bank of England, they seem to be tracking the activities in the US, even though we have seen moderation in that space as well. So the, the, the central theme here is that there is willingness to cut rates, but there is no doubt about it that all of these monetary authorities have focused on you know, how much inflation is moderate, because that will be the deciding factor as to when you know, inflation, I mean, interest rate is expected to, 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 to moderate. But the truth is that nothing lasts forever. Uh, and that includes higher yields. You know, the the what we are trying to the theme of our of our uh, webinar this time is suggesting that is higher yield the new order. Now we know that from all of the factors that we have analyzed so far, there are regions where interest rates is expected to start coming down as early as you know the end of the first half, and there are other regions where we expect interest rate to start coming down from as early as the late second half. Maybe the latter will speak more to the US market where we are seeing you know, a bit of stubborn inflation. But when you check across curve, you will see that higher yield is not something that lasts for long. You know, and as a matter of fact, maybe the current episode has been the, the most stretched, uh, you know, bearish, bearish run that the market has experienced. But that's not to say that this will be the new order. You know, as a matter of fact, we know that it's only a matter of time. Uh, from as early as this year, most of these systemic central banks will start cutting rates. And that is the message here, because when you look at US 10-year yield, the Euro, Eurozone 10-year yield, and of course, UK 10-year yield, you see, particularly U, UK, UK Treasury and US Treasury, you know, they seem to move in the same direction, uh, with ECB taking the lead in that, in that regard. Now that said, for the domestic market, when you look at you know the episode in the domestic market, you know it's a bit different because in the domestic market we are seeing pressure it's coming from you know um, not just the imported inflation occasioned by um, the the weaknesses in the currency market, but we are also seeing it as a supply side factor. Uh, given that you know farms are not able, I mean, um, a lot of farmers are not able to go to the farm successfully, and increased cost of inputs, you know, across board is impacting on you know domestic inflation, which we are expecting will peak at around forty point seven two percent in the month of May, and once that happens, we then begin to see some sort of moderation. That is, if we don't see other pressure points, you know, coming from increases in electricity tariff which has now been, you know, implemented and, you know, other weaknesses from foreign, uh, from currency volatility. Uh, now, you will notice that we saw some moderation in the, in the exchange rate, but I mean, in the past few days, you have also seen, you know, further pressure. Uh, we don't know where, how much that is going to, you know, to last, but one thing is clear, when we look at the market from a fundamental point of view, the current level of exchange rates is still a bit more attractive, you know, relative to where we think the currency should be, you know, fundamentally priced. But when you look at all of these, the inflation story and the NPR, you know, it looks as though uh, one elephant in the room in the domestic market is inflation. And um, maybe, you know, the current inflation is not just answerable to the interest rate, I mean, to the um, uh, to the pressure we are seeing, you know, in terms of the volume of money supply alone, as it appears that the monetary authority may, may be targeting more than just bringing down inflation with the NPR um, increases that we have seen in recent time. Now, the painful approach that the central bank is applying, you know, is to increase interest rate for the purpose of bringing down, you know, uh, inflation. But when you look at the rising government, you know, debt service, I mean, we, we, we've, we've analyzed this over the years, and even now, given the current um, budget of government uh, from a 6.3 trillion in 2023, we would expect an average of about 9.1 trillion in debt service to, I mean, debt servicing cost over the next three years, that is 2024 to 2026. As a matter of fact, it is expected to rise by at least 84%, you know, within those three years. Now, when you look at that, as I mean, relative to threats, you know, coming from economic growth, you know, I mean, from a 2.74% in 2023, 
um, you know, government is projecting an average of about, you know, 4.26%. But more importantly is the journey from what the current government or current administration is preaching that, um, you know, government expects our growth, uh, sorry, I mean, our GDP figure to hit a $1 trillion mark. I mean, and in 2023, we were at $255 billion. So that journey is not quite clear how government wants to achieve that. But definitely, um, there's a rise in credit risk for the country because of the debt profile. Uh, there is the threat to the balance sheet of government. And ultimately, this will impact on the financial sector in the near term. Now, the truth about market is that it's in cycles. You know, market moves in cycles. And when you look at the Nigeria's yield story, you know, it's not just about inflation. I mean, over the years, if you track, in fact, we track from 2008 to, to date, to 2024, you will see that every time there is, there is a rise in inflation, you know, um, interest rates, that is the higher yield from coming from, you know, uh, interest rate hikes has not always solved that problem. And as a matter of fact, you know, you will see higher inflation versus a lower yield. This is not the first time it happened between 2009, 2010. We saw a similar episode in 2016. We saw a similar episode in 2020. The question is, what is different about this current time that the central bank is trying to tackle, you know, the current inflationary pressure using the instrumentality of interest rate? Now, the point is that that may not be the whole story. That is the whole story that, you know, is compelling NPR hike is not necessarily because the central bank is trying to uh, put a rein on inflation. There are other factors, you know, one of which could be the pressure on the currency market, which the central bank believes that attractive interest rate environment may help to, 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 to absorb. Now, in the short term, when we look at the, you know, um, the outlook in terms of higher for longer interest rate cycle. When you look at it from both global and domestic markets, you know, it is suggestive that in the near term, what we should expect, you know, battle against inflation is almost over. You know, and if the battle against inflation is almost over, it means that interest rate is not going to be up for longer. So what should we then be doing? Because central banks are waiting for the word go uh, as far as inflation is concerned. So that once the signals are clear, you know, from both developed uh, market and emerging markets, you start begin, they will then begin to see, you know, lower uh, tracking down of uh, interest rates. Now, the point is that the market is, you know, clearly in an oversold region when you track not just within the global market alone, but also in the domestic market. And all of this is as a result of uh, the pressure coming from, you know, interest rates uh, occasioned by inflation. So the point is, a soft landing has been achieved so far. If you if you put your mind back to our uh, strategy call over the last one year, you will see that we've been talking about a soft landing, you know, uh, with regards to inflation and you know global growth. We are seeing that soft landing because we are seeing signals of moderation in interest rates. Uh, sorry, in inflation, and that will mean that uh, over the next couple of months, we will see tracking interest rates also tracking down. Now, imagine markets cannot bear for too long a higher interest rate environment. And we then say that even in the local market where you are seeing current high yields, it cannot stay for longer because it then begins to put pressure on financial system stability that the central bank cannot afford. What that supposed, uh, presupposes, therefore, is that we expect a bull run in the near term because if interest rate is going to moderate over the next couple of months, then it is better to position uh, from, from this period. Now, that now leads us to our strategy, which we have consistently preached in the cost of our you know, uh, investment you know, strategy playbook. And the first that you know, we have talked about consistently is the reason for you to diversify your portfolio. Now, this is a time where you need to not put all your eggs in one basket. Not only should you be diversified across asset classes, but we bias towards fixed income, as we are going to see in the next couple of slides. But more interestingly, you need to also diversify within markets. And that's why we are tracking for you a couple of global markets, developed fixed income markets, and of course, um, uh, imagine and, and, and local market. Now, timing the market is one thing that we have preached over the couple of last couple of months. Now, this is the best time to position in the fixed income market because, you know, 
the episode of higher yields that we are seeing now is not going to last. That's the truth. And if it's not going to last, the earlier you can position, the better you can benefit from you know, what is likely to come. Uh, we are playing the duration because our bias is towards the fixed income market. And to play that, you have to stay invested. Because when you are invested and you have a strategic view about your portfolio, then the message we are adding to our strategy this quarter is that you need to be less tactical. You know, tactical strategies are those you implement when you're just trying to take short-term opportunities in the market. But this is not the time for tactics. This is the time to stay invested because we think that the curve is going to turn and it's going to turn very soon. So in that, in that case, we made an ideal portfolio allocation. And from that perspective, uh, putting less pressure uh, on tactics and you know uh, uh, playing more the strategic allocation. We have about 50% allocation to fixed income. Um, for money market, we have 20%, uh, which is still tied to the fixed income market. So bonds and money market will take about 70% of our strategy uh, for the rest of the year. But for commodities, real estate, and alternate, other alternatives uh, like digital assets, private equity, and venture capital, we've allocated 10 10% apiece. Now, what that means, therefore, is that if you are playing within the fixed income space, our allocation is more biased towards the sovereign. The sovereign is taking about 80% of our strategy uh, for fixed income. And from 80%, we go to the short end of the curve. The short end of the curve, uh, sorry, the corporate is taking about 20%. But when we look at the short end of the curve as well, we've allocated more to the to the uh, to the long end at 70% and 30% at short end. And in terms of activity, we, we advise you know nothing more than 20% uh, for activity play. Now, if you look at the fixed income you know, strategy for 2024, our opportunities are focused on the long term, you know, across markets. Now, because of the interest rate hikes that we have seen, uh, it's happened in the developed fixed income market. It's happened in the emerging market. We've seen it in frontier markets. Nigeria not been an exception. Now, what that means for us is that because interest rates are almost at, you know, their recent high levels, you know, uh, positioning at this point in time, not minding whether interest rate is still about to go higher. Because, you know, but I mean, timing the bottom of the market is one thing that is difficult to do. But because we're already seeing, you know, interest rate at a level that is already attractive. And if you study even the local market, you will notice that the DMO has been quite reluctant to take interest rate higher after we had the peak. So what that means is that the, the, the earlier you start positioning to what we have now, the better you can take advantage of the opportunities that, you know, the market has to, to offer. So across market, both developed SSA and local fixed income market, uh, Eurobonds not being an exception, we have allocation across board uh, that is targeting, you know, US Treasury allocation at about 60% Euro and, and yields, that's for the, you know, UK, UK bond uh, at 20%, as well as, uh, you know, global corporate market as 20% as well. Now, this is to ensure that you, you, you really are able to take advantage of the opportunities. Now, one of the ways you can do that is to do direct investment in those markets. And, you know, we are here for you uh, if that is one area that you would like to pursue uh, for your portfolio. On, in terms of equity, equities, you know, are more, you know, we've seen a, a, a lot more rally. You recall that Victoria mentioned that Nigerian market is a, is, a, is a big price now in terms of price to earnings multiple when you compare us to other frontier and emerging markets. Now, what that suggests is that, you know, we've seen inflationary pressure also impacting on, you know, uh, domestic equity prices. So that means that if we must take advantage of that space, we have to be very selective in terms of stocks, you know, and then uh, one of the things we have seen recently is the recapitalization of, of banks, uh, which the central bank announced that has impacted on a number of, you know, Nigerian banking stocks. But not with that notwithstanding, we are still seeing opportunities within the space. Uh, there's a changing landscape. It demands reassessment, but definitely there are opportunities. These are a number of stocks that we keep tracking for you each time we meet uh, during this investment strategy call. And for some of the stocks, we've seen significant upside, but some, you know, still present a bit of more upside. Of course, there are some others we think that are already overvalued. 
you know, and um, you know the the upside potential right now is in the negative, which means that if you have those stocks, you should be disposing them at the moment. Now, moving away from equities and rounding up, you know, all of the conversation is to note that. Um, you know, every market moves in cycles, as we have mentioned, and I'm speaking to my last slide, you know, so that, you know, we can take your questions. Every market has its own, you know, cycle. There is ups and there are downs. You know, what is so certain to us is that wherever the state the market is now, which is more on the bearish end, we are going to see the end of this as well, you know, and that's why we picked the quotes by John Bogle, who is the founder of Vanguard Group. You know, uh, Vanguard Group, by the way, has the largest, the, the global largest uh, uh, mutual fund, you know, printing at about $7.7 .7 trillion. Um, what the guy says, I'll quote, your success in investing will depend in part on your character and guts and in part on your ability to realize at the height of ebullience and the depth of despair alike that these two shall pass so and that's the message we're speaking to you um our you know retinue of investors who are joining us on this call that the current market bearish run shall pass but how you position in this market at this time when the opportunities are very you know right is what will determine how well you take advantage of it when that time passes and when the market indeed comes Thank you very much, Sharon. I had over to uh, hand over to you. Thank you very much, Robert, for that presentation. So we have a few questions that um, we need some answers. Uh, firstly, I'll start with this um, from an anonymous attendee. He said, "I've heard that our FX reserve are being used to pay off our debts. Is there is this a major risk to the country or for the country, Robert? The question is for okay, you. Okay. Yes. So let me take that." Um, yeah, so, you know, by their very nature, reserves are meant for, um, I mean, as a, as a way of shoring up the, you know, the international, so I say the external balances of a country. Um, by the way, when you get funds into your reserves, there is a local version of that fund that the government has already spent. But what gives confidence to investors who are, you know, you know, um, taking up your the, the sovereign debt of the of, of a country in in foreign currency is the strength of the reserve. So um, it is not unlikely that the reserve will be used to pay off external debts now because they are denominated in dollars, and that is the stock of U.S. you know dollars that the government has to pay the debt. Now, what is not um, what is not allowed is for the government to pay off. Um, local debt using another debt, you understand, or using the reserves to pay off the local debt, and that's not likely to happen. Now, the reason is because at the in the event that the government cannot make up the funds, they can easily just print money and pay back the debt. But definitely for external obligations, uh, the government will often turn to the reserve in order to make those payments. And And, and as a matter of fact, it's not... Is not unallowed and is not necessarily, you know, um, a bad thing to do because that is the international reserves of the country for for meeting any other, you know, global or foreign obligations that the, that the country has. The truth is that the government must consciously work towards reducing our debt body. The debt body of the country is rising and the profile is alarming. If you check 2023 relative to 2024, and I think we showed it in one of the slides, you will see how, you know, um, how, how the debt profile skyrocketed. Now, that has implication for debt servicing as well. And because we are not consciously managing it, we may get to the point where the entire revenue is actually used to pay off and service debt, as a matter of fact. And government will then need to borrow more to meet recurrent and capital expenditure. And um, that is definitely where the country cannot afford to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Robert. Timmy Tokwe, I have a question for you from an anonymous attendee. So um, your outlook on exchange rate is quite optimistic. Do you think the CBN will be able to continue to defend the Naira with continuous supply 
to the BDC slowing amid the slowing oil production. All right, thank you very much, um, Sharon, for the question. And um, well, I, I really understand the um, the concern of the of uh, of uh, President asked this question, and um, why we think that well, we said something while presenting this slide that the uh, clearing price of the FS market is dynamic, right? It is dynamic. However. The, the assumption or, or the assumption that drive what we have here is on the encumbrances to reserves, right? Which to a large extent takes a forward view of money supply as well as the forward view or what we think is realistic for foreign reserves. So when we put all of this together, I think what is critical as much as the CBN is trying to defend the, uh, the, the, the Naira, right? I think what we, we we are seeing, and which is a qualitative factor that we include in our model, is the fact that the CBN, compared to what we saw last year, they are now able to anchor exchange rate. And how did they achieve that? We discussed that earlier, that at some point we saw that official market was trading higher than the parallel market. So long they continue to allow market to reflect what is happening at the official window. It is just rational for anyone to want to sell at the official window than the parallel market. So we think that in addition to the little support, because the level of support that the CBN alluded to some weeks back was barely, was barely I think, $50 million uh, um, or about 500 compared to billions of transactions that have happened uh, in the market. So just that a little support can really spike confidence and incentivize more supply into the market. So what we think is the confidence has been restored and if we don't backtrack on the uh, on aligning official rate to reflect um, 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 the market, um, market will continually watch what is happening to the CBN, and there will be little support from the CBN to keep the market around this band of 948 and uh, 1,354 naira to a dollar. So just to add a bit to what Tim Dupper said, uh, you will notice that what took our exchange rate to 1,000. 800 or thereabout was on the on the back of speculative activities. Now the same speculative activities, you know, were responsible for the crash that we saw. But ultimately, we will then have to, you know, come to a point where the currency is being priced from a fundamental perspective. And our own approach is to look at the reserves, which is like the stock of supply. And you know the money supply in the system, which is demand. We use money zero maturity, which is more you know um, you know um, um, which is more appropriate for that exercise. And if you look at that, you know I think the 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 the, the maximum um, we applied was a thirty percent uh, encumbrance to the reserve, and that was what produced one thousand three fifty four. And because this is scientific, it's only to the to the level to which the reserve is encumbered. That you can get the real value. So if you think that reserve has an encumbrance of up to 50%, then the exchange rate can as well be as high as 1.6 or 1.7, as the case may be. So encumbrance is the major factor that will determine whether you are, you, are, you, are, you are accurate in terms of the projection or not. But definitely our approach is fundamental and not, not speculative as we have seen, um, as I've seen speculation driving the market over the last couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. So our last and final question before we wrap up. Um, this is, what is the expected outlook for bonds and treasury bills rates investments for the rest of the year? Then also um, going by the FGM fiscal and monetary policies, also stock markets and fixed income. What are their prospects in the months to come? And which one is advised for a potential investor in the current year 2024? Well, I think that Babaji, you probably want to take a shot at that. And um, we can we can have more additions, but let me just say a few things, right? Um, for the fixed income market, you know, our presentation is clear. We are seeing market at a level that is, should I say, recently unprecedented. The last time you will find interest rates at this level um, was probably in the 90s or very early 2000. 
Um, the episodes that we have seen in 2016, no, sorry, let me start from 2012, 2012, 2013, and then 2016, 2017, they are nothing compared to the level of interest rate that we are seeing now. Now, it is understandable because those periods I mentioned, uh, the level of inflation in those periods are also nothing compared to the level of inflation we are seeing right now. I mean, Nigeria's inflation is printing close to uh, it's, it's printing close to 40%. And that is the level that we're expecting that uh, it will peak before we then start to see a moderation. Now, we have also analyzed the fact that the central bank, you know, is hiking interest rate for the purpose of putting a rain on inflation. But we have seen from history that it is not all the time that we have seen, um, you know, interest rates helping to correct the level of inflation. Now we've, we've, we've been able to highlight about three to four other periods apart from the current time when inflation was not, you know, really, uh, when interest rate was not really bothered about the level of inflation. Now that brings us to the conclusion that what the government is doing, what the central bank is doing right now is to correct the, the ills of the past years where you have seen the volume of money supply growing astronomically. You know, so and what they are trying to do is to use the instrumentality of interest rate to put a rein on that in the in the near term. Now, but because there is a cost implication to higher interest rate, as you can see, the debt management office have had to issue treasury bills as high as 21, 20, almost 22 percent. And also bonds yield as have has to be issued at that level as well. There is a level that it becomes unsustainable for the government. Now, marry it with the debt servicing cost that we highlighted, which we have already projected we grow by nothing less than 84% in the next three years. So there's a level the government can get to and can sustain a consistent hike in interest rate. So even if the central bank refuses to halt at this point, there's a level that the DMO will then start to take caution in terms of how they accumulate debt. And we are seeing a lot of those strategies. DMO is applying that. On the long end of the bonds, you are not seeing issuances of 30 years. GMO is issuing just 10 years, just so that they can con contain you know, the high level of cost. So the truth is that we are seeing a level of yield that is, you know, it's safe to say that we have not seen in recent time. So if you can position at this time, this is a good time to position. I mean, it's not a time where you take an investment and you say, I'm doing 30 days, I'm doing 90 days, because in the next 90 days, you will see interest rate go lower and lower and lower. So the longer you can take into the future, the better for your you know, treasury bills position and your and your bonds position and generally fixed income positions, including placement as well. All right, thank you. I will just add that um, you know our model shows that the appetite for um, the appetite to raise money from the local market is somewhat moderate in the second half of the year because we've looked at um, the budget deficits um, you know for 2024 and then we also looked at the number of um, monies that the government have raised from you know the local borrowings about 60 percent right so if you take 60 percent out of 100 percent you have 50 percent and then they still you know um, you know external that is likely to come out in the second half of the year. So if you look at that, um, you know, mix, um, one could, you know, draw a conclusion that the appetite to raise money at high cost um, may not be sustained. And as a result, um, use in the fixed income market and money market may begin to, you know, reflect that expectation. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, please, if you have more questions, you can also reach us on our email address, aaml at afroinvest.com. It's also in the chat box, aaml at afroinvest.com. Please do well to also connect with us on our various social media platform. With that, I want to wrap up today's um, webinar. Thank you all for joining. We look forward to having you again. Thank you and have a nice day.